Now-ish is when you're starting to work on your apps and your games. And so this is the historical morale low and high point all at once. It's the excitement of what you're going to build with the concern that you won't be able to build it. And so I'm going to talk to you for the next 45 minutes or so about what we've observed over the past three times we've done this. This is the fourth time we're doing it on the patterns that emerge that uh, maybe predict success, the methodologies you can use to uh, actually get your app done, and more importantly, to make you aware that we're aware of where you are and that what you're feeling is absolutely normal. So um, this lecture is on the development mindset. How do developers think? And how, over the next four, year, four weeks, are you going to turn into a real developer? We're here, and we strongly believe in learning by doing. And right now, it is very normal to feel like you have gone through a set of tutorials but are not sure how, with a blank slate, you could build an app, given that up until now, many of you have just been following instructions. And year after year after year, this is the exact same feedback we get uh, from students face to face in the anonymous feedback form. Students are all feeling this way. So if you feel this way, you'll be comfortable to know that most of you feel this way. Um, and most of you have felt this way at this time last year and the year before and the year before. And a demo day a few weeks from now, you will surprise yourselves collectively with how much you were able to accomplish. The reason that you are OK is that as you move forward in working on your own app or game, you'll be faced with a set of small challenges. And we've tried to help you break these things down into small bite-sized chunks. We'll talk about that more in a second. But as you want to implement a certain feature, you're going to realize that what you want to do is a lot in common with something you've already done. You're going to look back at a past tutorial, at a Mixtagram, or a Peeve Penguins, so on and so forth. You're going to grab a chunk of code you've already written, and then you're going to add it to your new project, and then tweak it to make it do what you want to do for your original app or game. And that, it's at that moment that you're really going to learn how things are working and understand what you did during the tutorials. If you feel like you don't know what you're doing throughout this process, don't worry. Like most startups are run by people who don't know what they're doing. And I've been fortunate enough in, uh, we recently moved offices in San Francisco, but we used to share an office with a company that would charge other companies to port their code to Android, to take their iPhone apps or games and make them Android. And so I had over lunch every week stories of well-funded professional companies that you've heard of with millions of dollars of resources and large engineering teams writing code that would make you laugh. So if you feel like, geez, I'm just copy and pasting right now. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm still figuring things out as, as I go along. It turns out that a lot of engineers are doing the exact same thing at actual companies, in large part, by the way, because um, this process is not exactly something students get to practice much in school. So a lot of people are doing it for the first time on the job when they start um, out of college. But this is totally normal. And one of the ways to get past this feeling of like, where do I start? How do I even write this first line of code with this blank slate I have, you know, new project, and now what? Is to really take baby steps. And one of the main points of the game design document, the app design document, is to help you break down your app into tasks, your tasks in you know, grouping by week, and then say, OK, geez, there's so much to do. Where do I start? Forget about the rest of what I'm supposed to do. What, what is on my plate for this week? What should I just do today? Take your task today, break it down even further. Break your classes down into properties and methods, and at least write those out. Don't implement them. Then take individual methods that you think, OK, well, I can, I can think of all these individual small components. How they all fit together is something that at any one point in time is too overwhelming. But if I break it down in a method, you know, methodical process, app design, game design document, all the way down to individual methods, and I just forget about the big picture for a second, just go ahead and implement these things, tick off steps on my checklist, and then take a step back every hour and say, OK, how does this all fit together? Connect the dots, rinse and repeat. And that's actually considered to be the more correct development process. You're not supposed to have to worry about the big picture at the same time as you're worried about implementing the small details. And so take baby steps, break things out into small steps, 
and then take them without worrying too much at any given moment about, oh my gosh, how am I going to get this whole thing done? And then every hour or so, revisit, look back at what you've done, and then get it working, move forward. This is so much more manageable. Um, the real trick here is to be able to enter the day with a list of tasks that all seem manageable. And that's a challenge in of itself, but I think within reach for all of you now that you've gone through uh, several steps of the brainstorming and, and design process. You also want to be releasing something that is really genuinely the MVP or even the MP, forget viable for a second, right? Um, it's important not to get distracted by features that don't answer questions that you have about your app or game. So an example might be Facebook authentication. Everyone has it. It's not exactly like you're going to do Facebook login in a revolutionary new way. So before you know if your app is truly useful, before you've tested out your app's core flow, before you've had people use it, doesn't make sense to spend time on your Facebook authentication. When someone opens the app, you should just give them a dummy account. You should just have it work off the bat, not worry about these menus that you know you can add later in a standardized fashion. Instead, you want to figure out the core of your app's utility, the core of your game's utility as soon as possible, implement that first and foremost, and start having people use it. Same thing for games. You don't want to worry about your high score screen. You don't want to worry about your shop. A main menu might not even make sense. It might make sense just to drop people straight into the gameplay. Make sure that that is fun and working, and then worry about adding the structure around that. So a lot of folks misfire by doing the boilerplate standard stuff that is not really going to answer any core questions first, when really what you need to do is strip away all the things that are a given, like Facebook login or you know, the share button that lets you send a link to the app to your friend, and worry about the actual core of the app first, build that first, iterate on that as much as possible. So um, shipping technically means submitting to the app store, but even think of it on a weekly basis, shipping to your peer group, having a version that runs, that someone can interact with, that doesn't crash, that you can show someone at a testing session, which we're going to start doing twice a week for the next you know, few weeks of the program. So don't just think about, oh, I have to ship early. I'm going to release my app to the App Store. I have to have a usable version that I can put in front of someone to answer questions I have about my own app on a regular basis and iterate on that on a regular basis. When you're writing code, you need to be thinking about the user always. And so when you have a choice between writing code that is easier for you to write or writing code that is, produces a product that is easier for users to use, always err on the side of building something that is easier for users to use. So taking shortcuts to get things done fast, always worth it if the user can't tell the difference when you're on a you know, crunch timeline. Not worth it on a longer term project, obviously. Your uh, teammates won't like you if you don't write good code. But when a user can tell the difference, so we have to draw the line and say, you know what? I'm going to write this in the way that is best for users. At the end of the day, imagine you have two apps. One is the best app ever, whatever that means for you. But the first minute of the experience is not polished. And 95% of people never make it past that first minute. You have another app, which is not the best app ever. But every single line of code was written with a user in mind. It was not as feature complete, but 90% of users make it past the first minute instead of getting stuck. It doesn't matter how awesome your app is behind the scenes. If the user can't appreciate it because of how they interact with it, they can't appreciate it because they get stuck at the tutorial, whatever it is, your app is simply not useful. And dissociating those two is dangerous. Saying, well, my app is actually awesome. My users just don't get it because my UI isn't polished is not a valid way of thinking. If your UI is not polished, your users can't get it, then the app is not awesome. So always have users in mind when you're writing code, and only take shortcuts that users can't see. Don't compromise the user experience, or you're shooting yourself in the foot. The whole point here is to build an app people are going to use at the end of the day. Um, a tie-in with this is the whole user onboarding process. 
So if you add a tutorial to your app or game in the last week of this program, it will suck. Almost guaranteed. An app or game that is theoretically brilliant, but for which you cannot think of a reasonable tutorial, is an app or game idea worth ditching. It does not matter how amazing the experience could theoretically be if a user ended up using it. If you can't think of a good, plausible way that within 10, 20 seconds, a user is going to understand the value of your app or game, then you do not have a viable idea on your hands. You might have a viable idea for something you might sell on the Mac App Store because people are more patient there. Maybe you have an idea for a game that you could sell on Steam, but you don't have a mobile product unless you can think of a plausible way that the user can get onboarded and really start getting some value out of the experience in less than a minute. This usually means building user onboarding as you go. So not just a tutorial you slap on at the beginning, a red flag, catch yourself. If you find yourself writing code that basically is, if the user is new, do this. Once they've gone through this, set the flag is user new to like false. And then forever after, skip this chunk of code and do something else. That means you've added an upfront tutorial that is just slapped on, likely not to be the best solution. Think about this deeply. Like, Don't present everything at once. When you add a new feature, think about how you can present that to the user in a graceful manner. Only teach your users things they need to know at the exact moment they must know them, which means usually spreading out content over time. You don't, you don't unveil all the features or mechanics of your game or app up front. You let the user discover them, and only when they discover them or have to use them to get to the next step do you actually add or show an extra step in your tutorial. And ideally, the gold standard is apps and games that are so intuitive, you don't really need an explicit tutorial. Um, the user can figure it out based on visual cues or some static text that is always there. Um, or you, know, you only show them things when they tap on it for the first time, things like that that are more interactive and discoverable. Uh, to give you a, a, a sense from a different industry of kind of a thought shift in how people think about onboarding. The olden days, you know, not even that long ago, 20 years ago, most board games that were being launched, and believe it or not, there was a thriving board game industry with new board games getting launched every month. Um, one, uh, one such board game company, the founding team, is actually the first investors in, in us. So I know a lot about board games, oddly. Board Game World, 20 years ago, I mean, it's a game. You have to onboard users. And the old way, 20 years ago, was you include a manual in the board game box that someone has to read and then teach everyone else, and then we all play. And if we don't remember the rules, we have to go back to this manual and reopen it and figure out on page three what does it say and what should we do here and now. That's the old way of thinking. That's the upfront tutorial, present all the information you need at once, right? Newer board games have a different way of thinking. They have a get started guide that guides everyone through playing the game as they are learning. Not only that, but they give every player a cheat sheet. Most new board games have this, a cheat sheet that reminds them the order of play and what they can do during their turns. So when it becomes your turn, instead of having to remember everything up front, you can rely on this cheat sheet and say, oh, on my turn, I can buy a resource and then trade it and then take a new territory. right? And this doesn't have to stay in your head. Offloading this kind of information was immensely valuable in making board games more mainstream because all of a sudden you were more likely to download or sorry to buy a complicated game and have a lot of fun with it because you weren't bogged down by this big manual up front. So think about this, like even industries where people are dropping 50, 60 bucks at a time and have historically been super comfortable reading large booklets, even they are recognizing the value in ditching that model of teaching and instead doing things as they go along. So uh, think, think of that analogy, and in particular the cheat sheets, good analogy for a game or app that has the instructions always present. For the games track, you saw Dumb Ways to Die, which was a, mini, a game that every mini game in that game, the instructions were always on screen. You never had to remember them. And I try to think about, you know, how could you design an app where you never need to remember the instructions, always intuitive, or the instructions are always on screen. Next up, 
we have thinking about edge cases. This is something that really trips up a lot of beginner programmers because you kind of get tunnel vision. You think about the way that you imagine users are going to use your app or game. Edge cases are when, and this is actually like a technical definition, it's when two condition or one condition is at its extreme at once. A corner case is technically when two conditions are at their extreme at once. So really we're talking about edge cases, corner cases. This means, for example, what happens if a user you know, taps as fast as they can? That might be an edge case. What happens, you know, so like tapping on a button before the view has loaded or something like that. Um, a corner case might be what happens if they tap on really fast on the buy power up button before you've loaded the amount of coins they have so you give it to them even though they don't have enough currency to buy it, things like that. Where you're not thinking about the extreme case, what happens if two extremes or more occur at once? You need to be thinking about these and actually make a list of them, like a written out list. These are counterintuitive enough. You need to add to your game design documents, app design documents, a list of edge cases you anticipate users could do in your app. What happens if they go forward and backwards really fast? What happens if they close the dialogue and tap behind? You know, there's a lot of things that you can, especially if your game or app is server connected and has to wait for a response from the server, a lot of things that you can mess up by having the app do something before you get a response from the server, right? And get things out of sync, for example. So this is something that I just want you to broadly think about. I am an expert at crashing Summer Academy students' games and apps. I'm really good at it, and I always do it by consciously trying to force an edge case. So I'm like, hey, let me try your app. And it's like, you know, all the students be like, yeah, it doesn't crash. I swear I tested it this week. I'm like, all right, all right. And then I like tap on it like a maniac and try to do everything all at once, and it crashes. Um, so if you don't believe me, uh, when your apps are more playable or usable a week from now, uh, have me try them, and I'll see if I can crash them. By the way, game track students, your apps are actually more prone to crashing um, because you're, you can sort of customize more things uh, and as a result do more things wrong. In, uh, except if you're an abstract student with a server connected game, then you have your own whole way of crashing things by getting things out of sync. So um, one way to break down larger problems, if you really get completely stuck, especially if Swift is new for you, is to break things down into pseudocode. So pseudocode is code that is not valid syntax in any one language. But it helps you stop worrying about optionals, stop worrying about exclamation points and question marks, and just make sure you have the logic down. So if you're getting yourself in this loop where you're just like, Thinking about Swift is taking up too much of your brain's CPU cycles and is preventing you from getting the logic of a certain method or function figured out. Think of writing super, super pseudocode. Very, very helpful. And actually, professional programmers do this all the time. It's a very, very common thought exercise. Like, forget my stupid syntax language. Let me just write pseudocode and then translate it over. And this is another example of not having to see the big picture all at once. Because if you break down a task into write pseudocode logic, and then translate pseudocode into Swift, you're breaking a task that at once might take you two hours into a half an hour task that is intellectually stimulating but accessible. And then the translation into Swift is a pure dummy task you can probably do um, without needing to think about the logic behind it. And as a result, you've turned a two hour complicated write new Swift code I'm not comfortable with into two separate tasks that together take less time. Testing. In line with edge cases, tap on everything. You have no choice but to be your own quality assurance team. There's like, you don't have access to a quality assurance team. You have your peers. You test with peers a lot. You need to test thoroughly. Um, I really hate it when apps and games are simple, have only three paths through the app or game, and yet the developer, the student, has only tested two. Um, you should just think and draw out what are all the ways that I could go through this app and make sure you haven't forgotten an obvious case. If you have a button in your high score screen to go back to gameplay or to the shop, you should not always test play, high score, shop, play. Try testing play, high score, shop, and then back, right? 
most of the time, the way that you mess up on testing is you get stuck in a habit of testing the same thing always. So you're trying to add a new feature, you hit the run button, you do the same four things always. Log in, you know, send invite, share button, close. OK, that worked. Great. Add a new feature, log in, duh, duh, duh. And you forget that you have other ways of traversing the app. So testing involves taking yourself out of your normal routine and imagining all the different paths to your app and then traversing them to make sure that you haven't forgotten anything. As a developer, software engineer, you can't be developing in a void. You have to utilize a variety of resources. Are these legible to everyone, even in the back of the room? So Stack Overflow, who in the room has used it? If you haven't, you will soon start using it. It's an amazing resource. 70% of ha Stack Overflow traffic comes from professional software engineers who are at work. This is not a website that is primarily for you, though you're in the 30%. It's a big number still. It's actually primarily for professionals. So you should feel very comfortable using it all the time. It's not a mark of a beginner. It's a mark of an experienced developer that you understand how to leverage Stack Overflow as a resource for yourself. Online tutorials, not just ours. Other websites are often very useful. Make sure that you're dealing with stuff that is up to date. Sometimes just check the publication date of a tutorial. Swift has changed so much in the last year that a tutorial that came out a year ago might not have syntax that is correct anymore for Swift. Um, open source modules. If you're doing some sort of feature, wouldn't it be great if someone had already written an open source module that lets you do that exact same thing? Look for it before you build it from scratch. Right? There are you know, even the simplest things. Um, health bar for a game. There's the health bar. That's been written so many times before. There are people who have, on GitHub, Cocos 2D compatible health bars you can drop into your project. I think Sprite Builder might now have something like that built in, but it's an example of something that back in the day like, would be super useful to turn to open source for. Um, and the most important resource at the bottom here is uh, asking for peer help. How many of you have asked another Summer Academy student for help on your projects? Awesome. This process continues into the workforce. The most successful software engineers at companies are the ones who are the most social and able to intelligently ask for help. There's, of course, a difference between nagging your boss every 10 minutes, saying, what does this function do? What does this variable do? And intelligently and tactfully and tactically, uh, tactically asking for help from someone who knows more than you do. But remember that you, a lot of you have complementing skill sets. Some of you know more about Swift, but less about programming in general. Some of you know more about UIKit and you know, from the Objective-C days, but are much newer to building products and using Parse. Some of you have used Parse for a past project that was unrelated to mobile, and so on and so forth. So a lot of you have combinatorially interesting ways to help each other. And um, helping others is a great way to learn. I don't know about you, but when I was helping my friends study for a test was the time that I really mastered the material. And um, instructors that make school, many of them are here because they feel like they get better just by teaching you. Um, so you really do improve by teaching and helping others. Particularly, amazing developers are really good at Googling. And it's kind of a hidden superpower because you assume that they're good for other reasons. But one of the main reasons that the average considered good developer is good, they're good at Googling. When you're good at Googling and you can offload information, not necessarily logic, but information to the vast brain of the internet, then you're augmenting your personal capacity tremendously. And you can give people the impression that you know things that you don't actually know offhand because you understand how to access that information so quickly. Good developers, great developers, are not tied to a particular language or syntax because they can take a step back, understand concepts, and then Google their way into figuring out that particular implementation. I would love for most of you to become, at the end of the summer, the kind of developers who, if you were hired to do a job that required Java and Android, and you had never done Java or Android, that within a week you could hit the ground running and understand the concepts behind the scenes of 
what all the moving parts are in an app, and then Google your way to filling in the gaps as to how you do each of those parts in Java. And in the beginning, you may not be a fluent Java developer. In fact, you may not be able to write Java code from scratch, but you still would be able to put together an app using Java and Android because you can take these higher level concepts and Google your way to a solution. So this is the new way. Um, this was not, of course, true of good developers 20 years ago, but this is now the superpower of a new developer. But not just good Googling. Actually, no, we have some hints on how to Google. So uh, in programming, unlike most other uh, disciplines, second page of search results, often very useful. Biggest mistake you can make when Googling an error for your project is including words that are specific to your project. So try to, you know, if you have an error that comes up, try to delete the words that are specific to your project. You'll get more results um, and uh, uh, more hits. You also you know, can think of rephrasing. In fact, everyone should probably just take notes on, on, these, on these few hints. And we'll put the slides up later so you can, you can uh, review them later. But this is. If you don't think you're a good Googler and you see someone who is, it's like, whoa. Like the speed at which they can just navigate tutorials and access information is super high. Also, it's how make school mentors end up being useful at hackathons, even in technologies we don't know. I don't know JavaScript, I'm ashamed to admit. I've never written a line of code in JavaScript. I debug code in JavaScript at hackathons all the time for students. Because when they come to me with a problem, they tell me what they want to do. I can Google my way into a solution much better than they can because I have that level of experience with Googling. Good Googling, superpower. Next up, good debugging is a superpower. When you combine good Googling and good debugging, you're basically 90% of the way there to being an amazing developer. There is such a difference between a developer who can break down a problem and debug it effectively and developer who just hits a wall and doesn't know where to go. And if you can debug effectively, then my claim that you should be able to take a job doing Android with Java after the Summer Academy ends becomes all the more plausible because you can not only find on the internet resources on how to implement each moving part of a mobile app, which you now understand what all the parts are, but you can go ahead and when you try to implement a part, it doesn't quite work. You can debug and figure out what's going wrong and fix it, even if it's not a language you know off the top of your head. So what are the uh, aspects, you know, uh, characteristics of a good debugger? Um, again, we'll post these slides. I'm not really into reading off the slides. By far, the most common rookie mistake is writing too much code before testing it and not being able to isolate what line of code actually causes the problem. So it's all about isolating the problem. Um, it's all about you know, a long line that says three different things. Break it into two different lines. I mean, this sounds silly sometimes, but you know, you'll all write you know, int a equals 3. Could theoretically be broken into two different lines. Int a, a equals 3. That example sounds silly, but when you're dealing with more complicated situations, breaking off assignments and declarations in separate lines can be very useful. Um, compartmentalizing things as much as possible can be very useful. Commenting out irrelevant code so that you're only running the things you know should be working can be very useful. And generally looking for all the signs of something working the way you expect. right? So one of the ways that I can often catch mistakes or issues in students' projects is I ask them, what are the assumptions you're making here? So if this were to be working, well, yes, it would not crash. Fine. I agree. But what else would be true if this was working? And they'd be like, well, you know, this variable would be non-nil. It's like, oh, OK, so that's, that's one of the assumptions, is that like, if this piece of code works correctly, this variable is not nil. Let's check if that's true. Oh my gosh, it's nil. I didn't look at the direct event that was occurring, the crash. I looked at the assumptions that were being made and tried to isolate the problem by figuring out what's the line of code where things diverge from my assumptions. Since you are all going to be doing the learn by doing methodology, meaning you're all going to be copy pasting chunks of code from your old tutorials into your new projects, one of the most common 
debugging steps that you will run into is code that you've already written copied into a new project that doesn't work anymore. Two steps when that happens. It's going to happen to a lot of you. First step is isolate every single line that is different. So if you've changed a single thing, check. Why is this different? A lot of people make small mistakes when modifying from the original that they just don't notice, like even typos, things like that. So compare side by side. If you have a chunk of code that's working and an identical or almost identical chunk that's not working, compare. Where are they different? And then step through the one that is working and write down all the things that are side effects of this code running. So you step through, you go, OK, well, when I run these five lines, this variable gets initialized. It should have this value. This thing gets added to the array. And this button shows up on screen. OK, cool. Let's look at my corresponding chunk of code that's not working. And guaranteed, before you get to the final issue that's not working, maybe the button isn't showing up, you'll find something earlier that diverges. You'll be like, oh, wait. Before even noticing the visible side effects of my code not working, there's already something in the process that doesn't match with the code I know works. So this is very, very helpful since you're going to be dealing a lot. You're so lucky to be dealing with code you know works and very close copies of it that are going to be not working. You have that reference. Use it to your advantage. That's probably the most valuable thing you have. So app students, we'll have a game example in a second. App students, imagine object, actually, no. This is for game students. Game students, imagine object is not showing up. I don't know, you have a platform, should appear, platform is not appearing. What's going on? Right? So many things could be going on. Is it in Sprite Builder? Is it in code? Did I forget to initialize it? How do I get to the bottom of this problem? Why isn't my platform showing up? So here's a list of things that you could do. Right? Like, are the objects actually added to the CCB? Did you remember to drag it in? Sounds silly. But sometimes you'll create it in code. You'll have a CCB file, but you'll forget to drag it into your main scene, something like that. Um, is there a connection between the object in Sprite Builder or the class in Sprite Builder and the object you're creating in code? Is it actually getting initialized um, you know, correctly? Like, are you remembering to create it in the first place? And is it being loaded? Like, Can you show that anything else in that scene has been loaded? Uh, is are a bunch of other things getting successfully loaded in code you've written except for that one? There's something special about that line of code. But if you realize nothing in that chunk of code is being loaded, then it's a sign you're not loading things correctly. So let's imagine two different examples. Exa you know, number, example number one, I'm, I have three lines of code that load three platforms, and my one platform isn't showing up. Example two, I have three lines of code that load three platforms, Platform isn't showing up. So on the face of it, it's seen the same. I debug one, and I realize, oh, wait, none of the three platforms are showing up. Easy to miss sometimes. Maybe the other two were going to be created off screen. So you didn't initially notice that none of them were being created. You only thought the middle one that's supposed to show up on the screen was missing. But actually, they're all missing. What do you realize then? If all three are missing, maybe something really silly like, you forgot to call this function, and if the code is not running at all, it's happening. Or all three of them are missing a code connection, something like that. In the other case, if only one of them is missing, you know that that one line of code is the issue. It's more likely to be a mistake with that specific object, platform, so on and so forth. Spotting the difference between these two is very important. And time and time again, we have students. Oops. Can you switch me back? I'm supposed to meet with Alex. Where's Alex? Hi, Alex. It's your fault. Ooh. So differentiating between these two cases is very important and is one of the things that makes a good debugger. You will learn how to become a better debugger by answering the questions that instructors ask of you when they come by. They're going to be like, well, do you know what's going on here? The more time you say, oh, wait, I don't, think of that as the more opportunities next time to debug more thoroughly. So um, if you can't figure things out with these high-level steps, what are some deeper steps? You could use breakpoints, same as an abstract, very, very useful. You could, of course, print stuff um, to make sure that output is matching what you expect. You could explore other parts of the code that are supposed to modify this and make sure what else is accessing this code. Um, a question that too few students have an answer to. 
whenever a chunk of code isn't working and I ask, OK, what else is modifying the variables here? You need to know. If those variables are publicly accessible, another class can modify them, you need to know. What if there's an update function running that like sets, you know, overrides some value, that update is in a different class, you need to know that or else you're going to be debugging forever over here without taking into account the impact of what's happening over there. So very, very common sort of missed, uh, missed debugging step. Now the app example. Mixtagram, you're missing some uh, shared photos, right? Um, so you're, you're following some people, photos are not showing up. Why could this ever be? Well, again, as you method, uh, methodical about it, you have to check things like, are things showing up in parse the way that I expect them to, right? If it's not getting created in parse in the first place, then of course it's not going to show up in my app. If it is getting created in parse, then I have a different problem. It's just not getting pulled properly. These two are very important to differentiate, right? Like, are you going to spend the next hour debugging parse? Or are you going to spend the next hour debugging your Swift code? Um, I think better we just put these slides up and have everyone read through them. Basic steps, debugging steps. Um, Daniel, do you know if there, or Jordan, are these available in the additional resources yet? Not yet. All right. They will be later today? Sweet. So put these slides up. You can read over these examples. And if you ever get stuck somewhere, you just can't debug your way through, remember this presentation, pull up these slides, quickly read over them again, make sure you didn't forget some step that we're recommending. All right? Very likely that you, that you are and that you can kind of recall what you should be doing by looking back at these slides. So uh, Zach talked about it at the very beginning of Make School, but I want to remind you that rubber ducky debugging is actually a real thing. It, uh, you know, getting a rubber ducky and talking to it about your bug happens to actually reliably help. If you're not comfortable talking to rubber, debug rubber duckies or talking to yourself, you can just talk to a fellow student. But it turns out that the process your brain uses to turn a problem that is in your head and get it all the way to your mouth, and by doing so, having to articulate what the problem is more clearly, often results in you figuring out the problem mid-sentence. The number of times that I get called, or at least last year when I was manning the code queue, when I would walk over to a student, they would explain to me their problem, and halfway through the sentence, they would have the solution that they had spoken out loud and be like, oh, right, OK, I'm good. Happens all the time. So, um, try this trick. Try verbalizing your problem and what's going wrong, and all of a sudden, tends to come to you. So, how to best get help? Make sure that you've covered what, you know, basically all the debugging steps. Like, when you ask for help, it's very difficult for someone to give you generalized advice. Much easier for them to help you if you know what the problem is. Also, it helps you ask the right kind of questions. If your problem is that things aren't getting created in a parse, you want to find someone or talk to someone about parse, hopefully someone who knows a lot about parse. If you have a problem where it's not pulling properly from parse, that's a different question. Maybe a different person is best to answer that. Understanding the difference is really, really helpful in getting help effectively. And that's the difference between someone who, in a company, now we love you all, so you can ask questions all the time. It's totally fine. But at a company, the difference between nagging someone, saying, I don't know why these pictures aren't showing up, and proactively getting help in a strategic manner, which is, hey, my pictures aren't showing up, and it's because they're not getting created in parse. Can you help me understand why they're not getting created in parse? Big difference between the two. And where, what you're going to find out is that you're going to have features that aren't working that are due to two problems at once. And so if you're not methodical about things, you'll never find the solution. Why? Well. You think, OK, if it's both a parse problem and a syncing problem, and you don't take things step by step, you're going to go, oh, maybe it's a parse problem. Change something on parse. Did it fix it? No? OK, change it back. You've made it broken again. Then you say, OK, well, let me change something in my code. Did it fix it? No? OK, change it back. Now you've switched it fixed and broken, fixed and broken, but since you need to both fix it at the same time, you never see the solution and you never converge on it, even though you have passed by the solution without actually doing it all at once. Being methodical, going through the debugging steps, helps to identify what is going on by breaking things down into smaller problems and not trying to solve everything at once. This side effect of this is you can ask help uh, for help more effectively. So um, 
as you get better at this, you become a much more powerful developer. Um, and you feel more comfortable approaching people of higher and higher skill levels with more and more complex questions because you've been able to go through a process where you can articulate at a high level what's wrong with your code. So this is really all about becoming a self-sufficient developer. right? And self-sufficient does not mean not turning to others for help. Self-sufficient means, given a good environment, able to progress using a variety of online and offline resources. And there does not exist, except for being an early employee at a small startup, there doesn't exist many environments where you don't have a peer group you can turn to. And even if you're an early employee, you're the, you know, let's say you're the whole iOS team at a company, because you're the first iOS engineer there, you have to figure everything out, you still have, hopefully, friends, a community you can turn to for help, and that does not mean you're not self-sufficient. Not being self-sufficient means someone has to come in and do things for you. And that's what you don't want. So we try, at the end of Make School, to leave you in a place where you're over the hump. You're a self-sufficient developer where if you need to learn a new set of challenges, you need to learn web development, you've never done it before, you're going to build your first Ruby on Rails website, you know how to tackle the problem. You know how to take your project, break it up into smaller parts, take each small part, break it up into tasks. You know how to Google your way to understand these tasks. You know how to find and read online tutorials, understand what they're doing. You know how to turn to help to people who actually already know Rails and understand what's going on when things aren't working. You can put all this together and hop from what we're teaching you today to learning more in a self-sufficient manner. It is actually not a random example that I say, oh, maybe you get hired to do Android every year. Make school students, immediately after exiting Make School, the first gig they land is Android development. And from what they learn here, they end up being able to figure it out on the fly and do Android work. It happens every single year. Same thing with web development, same thing with a variety of other things. So if you master this, it's going to be a struggle for your one app, but then you end up at the other end with a set of tools and skills that can be applied to a lot more than just mobile development. Developer mentality is one thing. We like to hone in even further on another kind of mentality, the hacker mentality. This is the person who almost relishes tackling these tasks that they aren't qualified for. And if you're not tackling tasks you're not qualified for, you're not learning as much as you possibly could be. A hacker is relentless about learning and confident that because others have figured out a solution, they can too. And it doesn't exist a solution, they will patch together something that works. A hacker is someone who realizes that everyone else is in the same boat, that everyone else doesn't understand what they're doing as much as they seem from the outside, and that doesn't let self-doubt hold them back, and instead forges forward as much as possible in learning, building, and breaking down barriers. You don't have to be this person, no one truly is, but you can strive to become this kind of person. So, Never giving up and never letting go when you face a problem in your code is a big, big difference between successful and not successful developer. Some people try to debug for five minutes, open Chrome, open a tab on Reddit, stay there for half an hour, go back, try for five minutes, go on Hacker News, stay there for half an hour. An hour and some has passed. They've essentially given up. They get some help from the code queue, make it to the next step. That's not efficient. A hacker, 10 minutes on a problem, that's a thrill. Because the it, moment it gets working is unbelievably exciting. And you work through without switching to Reddit or Hacker News or BuzzFeed or The Onion because you get addicted to the high of breaking down a barrier, solving a problem, getting the next step working and being able to show that off to your friends, show that off to your peers, and have an app that is increasingly more and more full-featured. So try to get yourself, and it's really tough because in the beginning, you face way more lows than you do highs. You get stuck a lot more, and it's really difficult to appreciate that one day you get to ride this wave of, oh no, really hard to build feature or bug. Yes, I solved it. Oh no, really hard to build feature or bug. Yes, I solved it. But that's the essence of software development once you get in the swing of things. And it always feels further away than it is, always. So this is kind of what we would like you to embody at some point, uh, loving the cycle of 
succeeding and failing and succeeding by failing. But remember, everyone else is feeling the same thing. Everyone else. Uh, or certainly almost everyone else. And when I started iOS development, I progressed slower than the slowest person in the Summer Academy is progressing today. So think about that. Why am I still here? I just didn't give up. As a side note, how do most startups fail? Any guesses? They run out of cash. Wrong. The guess was they run out of cash. You would think that, that makes sense, yeah? They give, up the they give up. Conventional wisdom says, oh, startups fail because they run out of cash. That makes sense. Reality, I know hundreds of startups. They fail because the founders give up. They literally, they have cash left in the bank. They can keep on running if they want to. They choose to stop working on it. Most common reason. So most common reason someone like you does not become a fully fledged software developer, they give up. For every Lyft and Uber, there were many people creating ride sharing services on demand through an app who had money in the bank who gave up. So keep that in mind. Success comes to those who persevere. A quote from Waz. Have you heard this one before? Hopefully it makes it into the new movie. All the best things that I did at Apple came from not having money and not having done it before, ever. Every single thing that came out of that was really great. I've never once done that thing in my life. I'm going to bring in, probably next week, my dad, who was on the original Mac team with Steve Jobs and co. And they will tell you, he will tell you, that nobody there had any reason to know what they were doing. If you were a 40-something person in a suit who had, produced a who had you know, gone through a traditional career and you believe strongly in traditional credentials and people needing qualifications and certifications to be permitted to do X, Y, or Z, you would think that not a single person who built the Mac had a reason to be there. There was no way that you could rationally trace by relying on a system where people should be qualified for what they do and say that any one of them was qualified to invent the Mac. This weekend happened to be my mom's birthday, where a lot of her old friends from the Mac team came to celebrate. I hung out with the guy who invented the Finder. I hung out with the guy who wrote the first word processor. These people were inventing all of it on the fly. All of it. They had no re relevant experience. They could think of an experience they wanted to create for others, and they invented what they had to to create it. So much of what the Mac was, and people of course talk about how parts of it were stolen from Xerox Parks research and stuff like that. If you go in the history, like they were definitely inspired by other people. But that team was, I mean, the one of the core developers on the Mac joined the team when he was in high school. He was a junior in high school. He didn't finish high school, and he worked on the Mac. It was a crew of people so implausible, late teens, early 20s. And they invented this thing. The reason they invented it is that it was a meeting of minds of the hacker mentality. They didn't even know that word yet, probably. They didn't, hackathons are not a thing. But it was a group of people who all had that hacker mentality, who were almost irrational about their ability to solve problems and get it done. So think about that. And think about how much progress and innovation in the world has been driven by people who were not qualified to do it. And think about how so many people who start something and don't finish had every means to do it objectively, but didn't finish because they gave up. And if you marry those two facts, people who are not qualified drive the most change. People who don't succeed are the ones who give up, not the ones who actually couldn't do it. You should feel very confident that over the next four weeks, over the next four years, you have what it takes, as long as you don't give up, to really do something great. Starts with an app this summer, ends with something much, much more significant. So that's the developer mentality. That's the hacker mentality. I hope that it inspires you to go 
design code, ship your own app, your own game, but also take it a lot further after the summer. Any questions? Great, back to developing. Thanks.